Hi. So, uh, I'm always curious, how many people have been to any prior version of this presentation? Okay. So there are actually a fair number of updates this year, um, uh, especially on sort of thresholds for SEO and some of what's happening on the sort of health of the internet in terms of um, what sort of um, censorship and blocking activity is happening and how that affects deployments. So um, uh, last year I tried an experiment that I think failed. Um, I tried putting all the updates first, um, and I found that that wasn't really establishing the right fundamentals for introducing a lot of those updates. So um, back to fundamentals first. Uh, so um, I'll be going over the business case for performance, like why you should care about it, or if, if you're working with a, a client or a manager, why um, this, what you need to tell them about performance in order to have them care about it, because it doesn't matter what your mission is, um, it matters. Um, the uh, current story around HTTPS and performance in terms of how they interact, um, how to deploy them effectively, um, the empirical results that we're seeing um, for sites um, given different deployment me uh, mechanisms at Pantheon, um, and updates since last year's presentation in terms of a few collective ones, um, although that, that rolls in a few updates um, even since uh, since 2018, um, because there hasn't been a ton changing in terms of the actual technology stack at the edge over the last year. Um, a, lot of, a lot is in the works, but not a lot has actually reached the market yet. So um, I'm David Strauss. Um, I've been with Drupal forever. Uh, um, my very first presentation at any DrupalCon was on um, caching with Squid. Uh, if that gives you some idea, that was in Boston in 2008. Uh, so I've been working on Drupal page caching and performance basically since my first interactions with the community. Um, I also serve on AMP's technical steering committee and on the Drupal security team. Um, so I think the most important thing to think about when you're looking at performance and security is the actual business value of it. Because it's one thing to say you just want to delight users um, or just have a site be fast. Um, and of course you don't want things to time out. But um, what's the case for getting things to be a lot better than just time, not timing out? Um, one of the first things I like to do um, as part of that though, is that um, it's important to not make the sacrifice of not using HTTPS, no matter how um, difficult it is to deploy in terms of some of the infrastructure you're facing. Um, it could be super easy, given a lot of the tools today, but um, it's basically table stakes at this point. So um, uh, for all of the reasons on the right, um, you absolutely have to deploy it. So th um, not deploying it is not an option in terms of business value. There's just too many things that, that fall through the floor. Um, you lose too many features, you compromise your user security, you lose search ranking. Um, it's basically everything. Um, so um, uh, a lot of the most, the most initial thing that affects whether a user is actually going to do what you want on your website is whether they can get to your website. Um, and many, many users reach your website via search. Um, and of course, almost all organizations care to at least a limited degree about organic search ranking. Um, the traditional signal um, at when Google introduced this seemed to be time to first byte. Um, I've added the qualifier on here, Payne Drake may use time to first byte because it seems to be really decreasing as a ranking signal um, and this, the data that validates it as a ranking signal is getting pretty old. Um, so I'm starting to get less and less concerned about it. It's still how you start the race for performance in the sense that you can never regain the time lost uh, to getting the first byte to a user's browser, but um, I'm not certain that this actually holds up at this point. Um, but what is up to date is that um, Google is increasingly using Lighthouse, uh, which is a more comprehensive set of metrics around website performance. How many people in here have used Lighthouse on their site? Okay, um, so if there's nothing else you take away from this talk, you should try out Lighthouse uh, against your site because it's going to um, reveal all sorts of performance issues that you might have, as well as provide a lot of actionable advice uh, for the things that are the most pressing issues for your site. Um, even outside the scope of this talk, it also uh, handles things like um, telling you a bit about the accessibility of your site, um, what the mobile experience is like, um, things beyond just painting something on the screen. Um, it also gives metrics on things like jank factors and other things in terms of the user's experience on the site. Um, but what we're seeing now, uh, and this is from the, um, the like late, late 2019, um, is that 
if you get your site to about 1.3 seconds for the time to first meaningful paint, that seems to be a plateau. Um, but you can buy um, some improvement in your search ranking um, about one rank for every 50 milliseconds of improved time to first paint um, uh, below that 1.3 seconds. Um, also, um, there is um, a correlation where um, using HTTP2 seems to matter a lot to Google's bot uh, because it, uh, HTTP2 allows us to pull down the resources in much more parallel form. I think that the end user benefits of HTTP2 are a little overstated, but the fact is, is that it seems to really matter for the Google bot and it doesn't necessarily um, represent much risk for your user's deployment or your user's access to the site. So. The two things that, that um, seem to be uh, well correlated with the, some of the Lighthouse data um, is your time to first meaningful paint and deployment of HTTP2. Um, these are the two things that search metrics uh, highlighted in their research in late 2019 on, on what seemed to be influencing search rank position based on Lighthouse data. Um, one thing that's notable here is that um, in previous presentations I've used the term just time, time to first paint. Um, this is time to first meaningful paint, which is a somewhat different metric. Uh, time to first meaningful paint is actually determined a little more heuristically on the page in the sense that it's not just the first time that the browser splashes something other than a white screen in front of the user. It's actually the time that your the, the site transition, the page transitions from um, lacking the majority of its content to having the majority of its content in the sense that if there's a main body of an article, the time to first meaningful paint clock will tick until that article actually shows up. Um, this has um, some pretty strong implications for load order, loading uh, order for a page in terms of things like ads. Um, so that it, what it means that if it's actually time to first meaningful paint that's influencing this, it can make sense to rank uh, to improve the render time of the main content of the page, even at the expense of pushing other ancillary elements down in the rendering process. Um, Google's definitely using Lighthouse for mobile rank. Um, they've been announced, they, they've been on this for quite a while. Um, they first announced this in early 2018. Um, they actually use different ranking sig signals depending on whether someone's searching on desktop or mobile, although they've been moving the desktop results more and more in the direction of mobile um, in the sense that the, um, the mobile results for a much longer time have relied on a comprehensive picture of the website's page load performance as a ranking signal, while the desktop one seemed to be lagging on time to first byte. It seems like these are getting harmonized now and almost everything seems to be converging on this comprehensive measure of performance for user experience. Um, so that's, that's what Google thinks, um, but what do users think? Um, uh, uh, actually, well, this is just the, um, this is just like users, you know, pick results higher in Google search ranking. But what users think is users are super impatient too. Although they seem to be a little less impatient than Google. Um, uh, this is um, from HubSpot's 2017 research, um, aggregating data from a lot of companies that do, um, that have sites and um, measure conversion rates. And th this is the drop off they saw that at 2.4 seconds, they had a conversion rate of about 1.9%, 3.3 seconds, 1.5. So in other words, um, about every second added to the um, page load time, and of course the user is perceiving page load time in a way that's probably closer to first meaningful paint in the sense that the user's patience clock is ticking until they see something that's actually useful on the page. Um, you can mitigate that a bit through trick, through visual tricks like having different ty types of loading things where you have like um, like a fake block piece of content where um, that gets replaced by the real content and buy yourself a little bit of psychological time with users. But um, by and large, like you basically lose a quarter of your um, your top conversion rate every second you add to it um, because users just run out of patience. Uh, this is really unfortunate um, for a lot of sites because. Most mobile sites actually are much worse than 5.7 seconds. Um, these are Google's results um, that corroborate um, uh, this in a similar way where um, for each of these jumps in loading time, um, this is the um, bounce rate increase that they're seeing from their data. Um, so it also goes astronomically high as you start adding seconds to the page load time. Um, so. In summary here, um, 
uh, for this part of it, like the business value, um, you have you have this sort of top of funnel that occurs above somewhat um, your Google Analytics or other analytics top of funnel, which is you need to get the user in the door. You need to have them wait long enough for the door to open. Um, and only then are you actually really starting to measure them accurately in terms of um, conversion rates as part of a lot of analytics systems. This has gotten a little better um, in the past um, three to five years uh, where a lot of analytics tools are now able to capture some analytics data even if the user bounces um, as, as opposed to the previous state of analytics where if a user bounced, analytics was one of the last things to often load on a page for optimization reasons and you often got no data about the bounce. Um, so uh, I would say that like measurement is somewhat happening somewhere in the middle of the user waiting for the page to load. Obviously, you can't get any analytics if they bounce before the time to first bite, uh, but it, it takes a little bit of data after that. So. Um, you don't necessarily know if you're doing badly on this unless you're actually um, looking at the psychological and SEO factors involved here. Because one of the things that you can get as a result um, of weird um, cor uh, correlations with performance is you can get um, a counterintuitive result where the worse the performance of your site, the more it looks like users are engaged. Um, and that kind of counterintuitive result, um, th that's not actually the case. Um, it looks that way in analytics sometimes because what will happen is, is that the longer you force users to wait on the page to load, the more invested the user has to be before they'll wait. Um, so basically what you do is you bleed the least invested users first uh, and then you bleed the more invested ones as the page load time continues to increase. So um, we've seen weird things um, on the AMP side where some people think that they're optimizing their site better because they're improving their conversion rate according to their analytics, but they're actually making the page slower and they're getting fewer users into the funnel. Um, so um, be wary of, of uh, simply um, uh, looking at the conversion rate that you see in your analytics tool and ignoring the uh, performance impacts of your pages. So. Um, I sort of like to summarize this. Um, I used to include time to first bite in here. I've dropped it. Um, and I've also moved time to first paint. I guess it's first meaningful paint. Um, uh, quite a bit down. Um, since there seems to be this um, now see, uh, sort of plateau with Google um, at about 1.3 seconds, um, you actually want to be better than that. And there seem to be, me there seem to be mean meaningful benefits at being even substantially better than that, up to a pretty good point. So. Um, but actually, um, it, it does kind of plateau around that point. So if you're actually at 1.5, 1.7, somewhere between 1.3 and 2.4, you're sort of in that window where like Google's not punishing you anymore and users' patience is not um, giving up. So you kind of need to choose exactly how much you want to fight this battle. Um, you almost certainly want to be below 2.4 seconds for, for meaningful paint. But um, if you want to aggressively pursue the complete package of high search ranking and delay delighting users, you really need to be fighting to get below 1.3. So um, there's always been a lot of um, discussion around HTTPS and uh, web performance. Um, I think that a lot of that FUD is gone today, but there are still some meaningful things that you need to take into account for deploying HTTPS to maintain great performance of a site and even get get better than uh, the performance you might have otherwise seen. So um, uh, there's actually a website called something like is TLS fast yet or like, I think it has all of the synonyms like HTTPS and SSL and all the things like that. Not quite synonyms but um, in that same sphere. Um, and the answer is like a qualified yes which is yes if you do it the right way. Um, the reason why it's been no in the past has typically been because of reasons I'll get into around round trips um, adding substantially to latency time. So um, kicking off your race for performance always starts with the time to first bite. Even if Google doesn't really care that much about time to first bite, it is sort of the starting gun of the browser actually being able to load the page, um, download additional resources for the page. Um, and you actually are really squandering valuable time if you wait a long time to first bite because the web browser can only wait on that first HTML result until it gets that, that initial set of headers and data um, to be able to start working on other assets. So it's pretty bottlenecked. Um, but the time to first bite is a product of um, the number of round trips taken times the, number, the amount of time for each round trip. 
Um, and they're both things that we want to attack here. So um, what's been fast and slow with HTTPS? Um, if we look on the left at sort of a pretty catastrophically bad TLS deployment um, that involves all these things that, that have been solved. Um, this actually represents sort of the model of, let's say you deployed TLS 10 to 15 years ago um, on a, a virtual machine um, on Amazon, uh, and you just basically used Apache to terminate it. This is sort of what you would end up for. Um, you'd have... Um, to, uh, one round trip for uh, TCP, you'd have uh, starting from the bottom. Uh, you'd have one round trip for HTTP. You'd have two round trips um, versus HTTP for the initial request. Um, this is all because of um, the initial TLS establishment of con or TCP connection establishment, like the SYNAC stuff. Um, this is in the initial negotiation of TLS um, used to require two round trips initially, um, and then you finally could actually. Um, send the page request. Uh, and this was particularly bad with um, pre-HTTP2 in, in a lot of cases because browsers would cap themselves um, at six connections and they would only initialize each of those connections after the initial one indicated that there were a bunch of resources to download. So you would often pay this, this entire cost twice. Um, this cost can be substantial. Um, uh, and here's like a summary of basically like old stack versus modern stack here, uh, where you can see an old stack in a typical case would need about eight round trips between the user's browser and whatever is um, serving the HTTPS in order to really get running in the race to download all the resources to render the page. Whereas a modern stack can accomplish that in about three. So even if you do nothing else on your server, then implement a modern configuration for TLS and HTTP2, you can actually substantially improve your user's performance because they just have to do far fewer round trips to and from your server. Um, and if you're just using a server and you're not using something like a CDN, those round trips are gonna be long. So every saved round trip is substantial. Um, the, um, the future stack here, um, it's, it's starting to emerge. Um, uh, it's kind of emerging piecemeal. Um, some of the pieces are in deployment as of 2019. Uh, they're not really broadly available to um, uh, to people setting up their own infrastructure at this point. But um, basically, the goal is to get um, even these TLS requests down to two or one round trip uh, by basically removing the HTTP, uh, the TLS, or sorry, TCP handshake uh, initially, where um, by each, because HTTP 3 is based on UDP, which doesn't require establishing that connection. Um, and then for just GET requests, um, and this is specific to GET requests because there's some danger in using this for non-GET requests, you can actually establish the secure connection and make the page request all in one request. So um, the promise for GET requests with HTTP 3 is actually nearly zero overhead versus plain HTTP for, for a simple page. And because it's establishing a highly parallel connection with UDP, you actually can flex this connection to do far more, <coughs> uh, flex this connection to be far more, to do far more for loading the page than a simple established HTTP connection. <coughs> Excuse me. Huh. So, I <coughs> uh, should have brought water. <coughs> uh, Oh, that would be awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks. Oh. So, I was mentioning that the two things we're trying to attack are um, the number of <coughs> are the number of round trips you're taking, as well as the duration of the <coughs> duration of those round trips. So, we've looked at how we can attack. <coughs> the number of round trips taken in terms of basically like trips to the store, but how can we bring the store closer? Because every round trip, of course, incurs all that time. So CDN is pretty much the only way to, um, uh, like the, whether you're using a commercial one or going to an extreme effort and deploying your own, like Netflix, this is the way to actually reduce the amount of time for a round trip. So even if like, you're never going to be able to get out of having at least one round trip, it's just necessary for the request to reach a server and for a response to come back. So 
what we can do is move where that round trip is recurring closer back to the origin. Now, one thing that um, I like to share about this model that's not something people always think about with CDNs. Um, how many people in here are using a CDN with their site? Okay, so like about a half. Um, a lot of people think about CDNs mostly in terms of caching of those resources where all these points of presence are storing these items so that when someone requests that item, it's immediately available from a local pop and it's able to download it to the browser. But CDNs offer substantial optimization even for your cache misses uh, because what happens is, is that all of this negotiation, all of these round trips, whether it's one, <coughs> whether it's one or a whole bunch, depending on the nature of the device connecting, uh, a CDN generally can ensure that any connection back to the origin is happening with one round trip. So, if someone's in Frankfurt and they're able to hit a pop in Belgium, um, and the website is hosted over in the US, say in Amazon US East, what happens is, is that all of this chatty negotiation can actually happen between Frankfurt and Belgium, and then there's one round trip over usually a pre-negotiated connection from the pop in something like Belgium to across the Atlantic. So you're basically optimizing for both cache misses and cache hits uh, by deploying a CDN in front of a site. <clears throat> so, I'm going to make a big assumption for these examples, which is that your Drupal instance can deliver an uncached page result in 200 milliseconds. Totally doable. Um, it's sometimes challenging, especially if you have a lot of uh, stuff going on with the site. But um, uh, in some ways, it actually kind of washes out in the example anyway. So, so what we have here is um, keep in mind um, what we were our goals from before is that we want to be able to render the page in about 1.3 seconds to maybe 2.4, depending on where you set your goals. So your time to first byte is a firm lower limit on your ability to render the page. So you can never regain this time. Any of this time lost is, um, is just spent. Um, and, and anything for downloading additional resources for the page, parsing JavaScript, run, executing JavaScript, parsing CSS, applying CSS, um, all of that is going to be uh, on top of this um, and will eat into that time versus the 1.3 to 2.4 seconds. So um, and with an old stack and no CDN on the same continent, um, and uh, for same continent, I'm basically assuming about halfway across the US. So like, let's say you hosted it in the central US, like near Chicago. Um, this is assuming that the access is occurring from somewhere like um, New Jersey or California, um, just to not um, have the model be overly optimistic, um, nor overly pessimistic by going across the entire nation. So um, what you're typically seeing um, with um, some of these uh, round trips is that um, they add up a lot with an old stack where um, if you have no CDN and you have an old stack, um, what ha ends up happening is you basically end up taking one round trip for the TCP, two round trips for TLS, one more round trip for the HTTP, and assuming you, d you just have HTTP 1.1 on the site, you probably have to double that for the rest of the parallel connections getting set up by the browser. So you're already at about 360 milliseconds before you've even um, had a chance to um, hit or miss a page cache. Uh, and let's say you miss a page cache um, and it has to basically request back to um, uh, an origin system um, that's uh, like, let's say a few hundred, uh, two to 300 milliseconds there. Um, so you're now at about 700 milliseconds before we've even given the browser a chance to truly download the rest of the resources and paint the page. We're vanishingly close to 1.3 seconds here um, and we're not even really um, on a heavy weight, weight Drupal site and we don't even have uh, much budget for um, the actual front end rendering time. If you do a modern stack with a CDN, um, you actually get some pretty great results. Uh, so um, because pops are often in a neighborhood area and they're often located at network operation centers, um, I often see ping results that are actually sub five milliseconds versus pops. Uh, so even if you actually have to um, uh, miss the cache in this case and hit the site uh, and go back to the site origin, you're still sub 300 milliseconds. 
um, in that case. So you actually have a fair amount of time window to get additional assets downloaded, um, to spend maybe a little bit more time in Drupal rendering the page, etc. But what really blows the budget is when you start going internationally. <laughs> um, so, or you start crossing an ocean specifically. So like if you're crossing the Atlantic, um, your um, round trip time um, skyrockets to about 85 milliseconds, and those are the corresponding results you get with an old stack and no CDN. Um, you do a modern stack with a CDN in terms of the way someone's um, accessing the site, um, you're barely worse than um, you were um, in the situation with uh, same continent because it only has to make one trip across the Atlantic in this case to, to, uh, to get that initial page loaded. And by the way, this is still modern stack, not like future stack with like HTTP 3. This is just HTTP 2, TLS like 1.2 with false start or TLS 1.3. Um, and then it really blows the budget when you start looking at like APAC North America over the Pacific. Um, you start having a round trip time um, starting to approach 200 milliseconds over, over a lot of those links. Um, and you just really can't even make the 1.3 second goal. And you probably can't make the 2.4 second goal uh, if you're in that situation, if you don't have a CDN attached to the site. So, um, this is sort of the old time to first byte latency goal here, 500 milliseconds based on those old Google results, but um, it's still a decent threshold to consider in terms of leaving yourself enough headroom for the rest of the loading of the page. So you can see here, um, with a 500 millisecond bar, the only way to really consistently hit um, a target like that, if you have an, inter if you have an overseas visitor group, uh, is to deploy a CDN in front of the site. So um, we've been talking about time to first byte, but that's just starting the race. Um, the time to first paint um, involves waiting on that time to first byte, which the browser then starts getting some headers in H HTML, and then it actually has to download all those resources and then render the page. Both of these additional metrics, in terms of the bandwidth um, for downloading those assets, as well as the actual CPU time for rendering the page are substantial things that are going to affect the actual rendering time of the page. The CPU time is surprisingly substantial in mobile devices, especially because um, older mobile devices are much less powerful than, than many of the ones that you probably own. In fact, the ones that most users in the world own are, are usually around a fifth to a tenth of the speed of what, what would be considered a modern flagship device. So, um, one of the things that um, um, I, uh, I got through working with um, some of the um, people who work on Chrome is, is um, they gave out these things that they called empathy phones. Um, and they were just designed, they were basically designed to be bare bottom things. They're, it's, before you think that it's anything fancy, they're worth like 20 or $30 at most. Um, and they basically are just designed to create an experience that a normal user would have in, say, a developing or emerging market. Um, so if you have users who are overseas, um, uh, it, one thing to consider doing, especially if those users are, are in developing countries, is actually consider getting a budget um, handset, a, a super old iOS device or, um, or a low-end, um, and I really mean low-end, Android device. Um, you'll, you might be shocked how bad the experience is on a lot of the web um, because just of this last factor on the CPU time. Um, I couldn't even really use the device. Like, I, I, I think it was designed to almost be like just an exercise in frustration. <laughs> The, um, if anyone wants one, I actually have a couple to send out. Like, I'm happy to mail mail a couple out if, if anyone wants to have a frustrating experience. <laughs> the, uh, um, it's not it's not actually like that enlightening, other than the fact that it's really really slow. Uh, also, the size and bandwidth. Um, the networks that are around the world are, are not that great. Um, even the networks in the U.S. are like even in this era of early 5G, not that great. I'll get into some of the details, um, but but basically. Um, uh, when you start actually looking at the assets on the page, it's really, really hard to actually meet anything close to a 1.3 to 2.4 second goal unless you actually use a CDN, not just for the assets on the page in terms of 
images, CSS, and JavaScript, but also for the actual HTML itself. Um, because if you have an asset-only CDN, um, you're still having to um, talk to that origin for each connection. You're still having to, um, uh, you're still not accelerating those connections in the same way, and you're not able to cache the page close to the user in the same way. So um, it's still good if you can get an asset-only CDN, um, but you really want to go the full scale. Um, most modern CDNs work this way. Whether you're using Cloudflare, Fastly, Akamai, um, CloudFront, doesn't really matter. Put it in front of the entire site. Um, not just your assets. Um, and this is how it sort of looks in this sort of like waterfall for performance. No CDN, no proxy page cache. Proxy page cache being something like Varnish. Um, it's really easy to just like um, have ridiculous page load times into these scenarios, like getting into four plus seconds um, even. Um, standard CDN, that, by that I mean like um, uh, asset only. Um, and not necessarily super modern in the protocols it supports. There are a million CDN companies out there. A lot of them still run older stacks. Um, this is why it can matter to choose a CDN that has a modern stack, um, because having the HTTP2 matters somewhat uh, for users, matters a lot for Google, but matters somewhat for users, um, gives you the page on the CDN, resources on the CDN, um, really clamps down that page load time. This is for the same page. This was actually based on an empirical test that I ran um, on, on some representative sites um, that we host on the platform where I basically um, corralled them into operating different ways in terms of what resources were loaded from where. Um, and we've also gathered some wide scale empirical results. Um, this is what we saw when we implemented a CDN on the platform. We, this is when we took all the sites from running just on Varnish at the origin to running against a CDN with pops around the world. And in fact, this is a little pessimistic for today because there are actually far more pops today than when these results were collected. <coughs> um, so, um, and this is what we saw for the first paint. Um, so CDNs matter a lot uh, for the performance of your site. Um, Um, one thing that we're also seeing um, that's really interesting, um, that's totally um, like different than just the performance, but is still related to your edge deployments, is um, how many of you have customers in Russia or users in Russia? I see a few hands go up. Okay, um, there's some really interesting stuff going on with the internet infrastructure there that we've encountered. Um, I don't know that this any of this is actually public yet. Um, the, um, this is just stuff we've encountered because um, some ISPs in Moscow were super confused about what was going on and they, they like reached out to us and we ran a bunch of TCP traces. Um, so um, traditionally um, censorship in Russia of the internet has been an ISP responsibility delegated from federal uh, organizations where they basically get block lists that they then implement um, at the ISP level um, basically close to the last mile. What we're seeing is the implementation of something that's really very similar in architecture to the Great Firewall of China, uh, in the sense where um, the enforcement seems to be moving beyond the actual ISP BGP routing, which it used to be that this part would just work without any interference at all. Um, this is what we're seeing today. And the reason why we know this is happening is because um, we're seeing TCP resets that are faster than could possibly be coming from our POPs. Um, like uh, out of Moscow, we're seeing TCP resets that are sometimes sub five milliseconds. Um, and the closest POP we have to Moscow is in Frankfurt. Um, the speed of light does not go that fast. Uh, the <laughs> uh, and basically, this is what we're seeing is happening. Um, and this is what might help, uh, affect your deployments. So. Um, if, it's occur if the traffic is occurring over HTTP, they appear to be analyzing the host name of the traffic um, and doing some sort of deep packet inspection. Um, then they are blocking or unblocking it depending on whether that ho host name is actually something that they intend to block. Um, what they're doing with HTTPS is very different. They, um, they don't seem to be looking at SNI in terms of the data going up to the server for negotiating the certificate which I'm not too surprised because a lot of the SNI is going to be moving to an encrypted connection over the next couple years anyway. But what they do seem to be doing is deciding that if you're going to an IP address that hosts at least one resource that they block, what they're doing is preventing TLS negotiation to that IP address. Um, 
We are seeing this specifically to individual IPs um, uh, that we know have some resources that are on the block list. Um, and what happens is, is that they just reset the, t uh, the TLS connection. And the way that it manifests in terms of the user experience is HTTPS appears to be broken and HTTP appears to work on, on the sites if the site is not individually blocked. If the site is individually blocked, then both of them will fail. Um, but um, this affects some, somewhat um, the experience on things like CDNs where um, you really don't get your own IP address on a CDN. Um, so you're sort of, um, there are sort of some spillover effects um, of the new way that they're doing some of this. Um, we're not really sure what to do other than if you need people in Russia to be able to access your stuff, you might need to spin up something like GeoDNS and a separate um, IP for the Russian users so that you don't send them to one that might be hosting resources uh, that, um, uh, that they're blocking there. Um, so, in just a little bit of updated advice on best practices, um, uh, this, is, this hasn't changed too much um, over the past year or so, um, but um, so some old habits die hard. Um, don't use separate CDN domains, it just causes additional DNS lookups. Modern browsers are pretty capable of parallelizing, especially if you're using HTTP2. Um, that's true for hosts, whether those host names are on your origin server or on a CDN. Um, and also stop doing any no, no HTTPS uh, for the sake of performance. Um, uh, by the way, um, oh, I, I forgot to mention one thing on this. Um, the reason why we've noticed a lot of this is because we did a platform-wide rollout um, of a default to do redirects to HTTPS. In some sites, um, people were successfully accessing them in Russia over HTTP, and then when we started forcibly redirecting um, everything to HTTPS, we suddenly started getting um, uh, concern from Russian ISPs that sites were blocked. They thought we were blocking them. <laughs> um, but uh, that was not the case. <laughs> um, the, um, so the, um, the present, um, like in terms of please care about these things, um, performance testing, um, focus on mobile time to first paint because that encapsulates um, basically all the concerns. If you can get your mobile time to first paint to be great, then you probably have a great experience on desktop too. Um, you need to, uh, compressing images effectively has a surprising amount of effect on the actual um, paint time of a page. This is the sort of thing that didn't matter as much when it was more time to first bite, but um, uh, Lighthouse will very bluntly inform you if your assets are not compressed efficiently. Um, so that's another good reason to use it rather than just <coughs> manually investigating. Um, another thing I also recommend um, taking a look at is sometimes people um, are reluctant to use long caching times for assets because they're afraid of stale stuff getting stuck in browsers. But almost every CDN that I've used it supports um, separate configuration, um, whether through headers or CDN configuration for the time stored in the CDN versus the time that browsers get for their cache control. Um, it could either be through something like surrogate control headers, um, uh, other kind of proprietary CDN headers, or even just configuration in the CDN itself. So um, try not to let fears of stale content in browsers uh, undermine your CDN strategy from being aggressive. And, and many of these CDNs also offer selective invalidation for content so that um, when it's in the CDN, you can actually rein it back in, whether it's fully clearing everything or selectively purging assets that um, have been modified. Um, uh, your JavaScript load order and the effect on jank are really important now uh, with Lighthouse. Um, load order is simply the idea of like how asynchronous it is. Um, jank is um, actually a bit of a jargon term that seems to be um, gaining more and more popularity at Google. It refers to the idea of what's the latency between a user's interaction with the page, like say scrolling or interacting with the page, and the interaction taking effect. Um, usually the scrolling. Um, jank is when it's um, often past a threshold where um, the performance is poor enough that you start noticing a delay where your interactions um, have a su substantial lag before the user experience uh, is, is modified. Um, Lighthouse measures this, I believe now. <laughs> so um, uh, not even just time to first paint at this point, it's even the, the user experience of interacting with the page. Uh, um, and also deploy HTTP2, even if it's just for the Google Lot. Um, Left. Okay, uh, I'll, uh, since I've done these other ones before, um, and I'll, I mean, these slides are all in line, um, I'll 
uh, open up questions in general since we just have a few minutes. Yes. So on a Caveat customer, I have a stack CDN situation uh, where we're using Cloudflare in front for the firewall, but we have not turned on caching. Um, we're using your caching. Is that an appropriate way of doing it, or what are the issues with the stack CDN? There aren't too many. Uh, because um, the time to get from a Cloudflare pop to a Fastly pop is really low. Um, uh, so the idea that you always mission Cloudflare and hit in Fastly is not too bad. But what I do recommend checking out is, is um, considering if you primarily want to manage your cache through, say, the integrated Fastly layer, uh, I'd recommend um, still considering a very short cache lifetime in something like Cloudflare. Even if you do one to five seconds, it can have a meaningful impact uh, on the performance of your site because at least when um, users are converging on the site or there are stacks of traffic, letting the CDN cache it for even a few seconds allows it to reuse it without having to literally make a round trip every single time. And I think that um, letting a resource that is valid to be cached be cached for a few seconds doesn't meaningfully affect cache freshness very much in the sense that um, you don't necessarily need to do any deep integration with something like Cloudflare in order to make sure that your pages are fresh if they're only getting stored there for, say, five seconds. For ones that are valid to be cached, of course. Like, yes. Have you seen issues at Pantheon using Fastly with the whole site cache being cleared all at once, unintentionally, and taking down the site? <laughs> So um, I imagine that could be a problem with cache tags. I like, don't see it too much, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Um, part of the reason why is um, there's a, there's stamp, uh, there are two layers of stampede protection in the way that we have fastly integrated. Okay. Um, one of the layers is that we um, we use their origin shield system, which a lot of almost most CDNs have something that's equivalent to that. I know Akamai and um, Cloudflare don't, certainly have equivalents of that, although I'm not sure that things like Cloudfront do. But what that does is if you miss at the pop, the local pop, um, it routes all misses to a pop near the data center that gives it a second chance to hit. Mm. Um, and um, But w what really makes that meaningful is that, um, uh, and I don't think all CDNs have this, but I know Fastly does, it's a thing called request collapsing where if the requests are cacheable, what it'll do is it will um, stack up all the requests for the same asset that it thinks are probably cacheable. It'll issue one request to the back end, um, get that request back, to, um, look at the headers on it, determine if it's, if, if it's appropriate to satisfy all the requests that it basically stacked up, and then it will satisfy all of them if they actually are all satisfiable with that one response. So if you clear the cache for your site, and you have a deluge of users coming to your front page, it still doesn't actually have that much impact on the load of the site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they, they get collapsed down to the local pop, and then they all got further collapsed down into a singular request. So even if a thousand people around the world reloaded it, um, the front page all at the same time after a cache clear, it would still get aggregated down into a handful of requests to the origin. Um, is there sites on Pantheon um, have trouble with explicit cache purging versus the ability to do a soft purge of the cache? I forget which one we do um, I, internally, like in terms of which, which one gets implemented on the platform when you do the clear. Um, so I mean, the support told me it's not a soft purge? I, do, I, I think it's not a soft purge, but I didn't, I'm not certain. Um, the, uh, so you're asking what the implications of that are? Or? Yeah, so if you've got a, a, a high traffic site and you know you explicitly, let's say there's a, a page element that's common to a lot of pages, mm -hmm. and uh, through a certain key you, you explicitly purge, um, or you, 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 know, you purge that, that key, well suddenly you've got a whole bunch of pages um, that are not going to be able to be bundled like you just described, you know, into a single request or response. Um, oh, th this happens at every level of asset. Sure, okay. Yeah, so even, even the like CSS, JavaScript, um, the CDN is agnostic to the nature of the request for the request collapsing, other than the fact that it will only attempt to collapse requests if the request um, is possible to cache 
and like if it's eligible to cache. That doesn't mean it will um, be able to collapse it because not every request that could possibly be cacheable it uh, turns out to be. But um, basically, like it can't collapse post requests, for example. Right. But if it's a GET request um, and you're not coming in with a session um, for the GET request, and we strip sessions for assets uh, for the most part, unless it's to private assets, it will attempt to collapse them. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Have you seen cases where um, a event set in Pantheon would be better served by having a soft purge available to it? I would love to move it to soft purge. Uh, we just need to look at the viability of it. Um, like soft purge is generally more desirable, um, in the, uh, but uh, also we would need to implement additional things to make the soft purge provide a benefit. Because a soft purge with no special um, support in the VCL added, a soft purge and a hard purge function very similarly because a soft purge still marks the asset as having zero time to live. Um, the question is, what do you do in your VCL with assets that are that can pseudo hit in the cache where it hits the cache, but the asset is stale? Um, that's when you start getting into things like um, stale while revalidate, stale with error, stuff like that. We've done those integrations for some of the custom CD integrations that we've done, like for, for customers, um, but not on the main platform one at this point. Part of the concern is a correctness one, where like um, it's not always appropriate to do stale while revalidate. Um, you might actually have things break in your application with that. For example, where if a, if a request comes in that's cacheable, but you rely on the fact that it's purged for a, say, let's say a user edits a page and you rely on the fact that it gets purged prior to them loading the next page. If you do stale while revalidate and theirs is the first request in, they may get the stale asset. Um, so um, it's, there are some complications there. Stale of error is a little less fraught um, because usually if, if the thing you got back from the origin is an error, um, then, um, it's probably better to return a hit to the to a stale cache item, um, but even that is um, even that is kind of um, something that is like a business logic question for some of our customers because some sites on our infrastructure rely on up to the minute information. Like for example, for a lot of universities, we run emergency information portals, and like. I don't know that it's always appropriate for us to do stale of error if, like, if their site goes into has an issue. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to provide stale information to everyone necessarily, and if it is, for what duration? Like, is five minutes okay? Is thirty minutes okay? Is an hour okay? Like, at what point um, is the information so stale that it's actually, say, dangerous to give out rather than helpful? Um, uh, the, um, we also run some websites for metro transit authorities, and like they rely on some of the freshness of the information. Um, so it's um, part of the answer is that it's it's a little bit of a minefield in the sense that um, it's it's extremely desirable when it's done correctly, but it's very hard to just sort of like um, just like uh, code it all over the platform <laughs> in the sense of like a, as a as additional functionality on by default. Well explained. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, a dumb question, but don't give it anyway. Uh, in terms of like an e-commerce site where you have some of the content that's not going to be cacheable to an individual user, how is that set up on your system or other systems where um, is it just that you're caching your assets and then you're just uh, delivering your page uh, individually and it, talk a little bit about that? At least in the configuration that we have on Pantheon, the way that it works is that if the assets are pulled from non-private directories on Drupal or, or WordPress, then then we um, we strip the session before considering whether to hit the cache. So an e-commerce site would still be able to hit things like product images, CSS, JavaScript, stuff like that. Um, if it's for the page itself or it's for a private file directory, um, then we bypass the cache if you have an active session for that for that request. Um, it's hard to really do something less substantial than that and still be correct. Is it something where um, your CD, are you all providing your own CD yet, or is it something where you're... you're it's built on top of Fastly. Oh, the Fastly, okay. Thank you. Big pipe? Um, I don't see anyone using it. <laughs> Um, 
So like, BigPipe is, so it, it's kind of complicated. Like one of the issues, uh, at least in terms of what we see, is that um, it's, it's kind of challenging to deploy in a lot of the CDN environments. Um, I think that Fastly is now capable of it, but um, a lot of systems basically try to buffer up the response from origin before pumping anything down to the client because they actually don't want to be like shuffling bits slowly back from the origin to the client in any, any way or like having the origin backed up. And like uh, it's so like traditionally what Varnish has done is it captures the entire page. Bef uh, well, it operate traditionally Varnish operates in two modes. Um, one mode where like it buffers the entire response it's eligible for the cache, but doesn't have to be put in the cache. And then it ships it down to the client after having detached from the origin. Um, the other way that it could work is like a pipe thing where it's like, okay, I'm just shuffling bytes back and forth. And that happens real time. Um, I'm not sure what the current state of Fastly's implementation is, at least for Pantheon's case um, around this. I know our edge proxy uh, buffers um, the entire response in a, certain, in a way that makes it not directly compatible with BigPipe. And we haven't seen enough pre, uh, um, interest in BigPipe to, um, uh, to examine what it would take to change that. Um, also, I just haven't, uh, I just haven't seen it that um, broadly deployed. Like it's pulled actually from a technique at Facebook um, and they have the resources to do all these sorts of micro optimizations to like send down the skeleton of the page and then juice it up with all of the actual custom data. Um, but in practice, with something like PHP and Drupal, that's quite challenging to do. Um, because on, like, in typical cases, what it means for the skeleton of the page is it probably means that the skeleton of the page needs to be shipped by PHP. That is intrinsically slow uh, to, to like, go all the way to PHP, have PHP hit something like Redis or Memcache, pull a skeleton down, pump that back out through PHP. Like, there's a reason why we don't like, proxy all files through PHP. Um, so like, in a lot of cases, what people seem to be doing more is less the big pipe technique of one HTTP response that sort of builds up and more the idea of hit the cache for something that is a lightweight version of the page and then apply customizations in something like JavaScript on the client side. Because um, then you can actually have it hit the skeleton page in the CDN. Um, and then... Um, that provides a much faster, like, first initial skeleton paint to the page. Um, and then the enhancement via, like, a round trip for getting the, um, the data to do the sort of um, hydration of the page is not really any longer than it would take to get that hydration data out of something like BigPipe. Um, so it's, um, I think it's, like, practically fraught in certain ways. What do you think led to Drupal developing big pipe support? I think there was optimism around the idea of shipping the skeleton and then and then hydrating it, um, because it is still faster than like waiting until the whole page is rendered in Drupal um, to ship anything down. Like it does get the time to first bite out. It does get, let the browser get working on painting. Like. There's a meaningful amount of time, especially on mobile devices, spent on things like the initial JavaScript and CSS. And as long as you don't have to reflow the page to hydrate it with the content, um, at least not reflow too much of it, um, you actually give it a good head start. Like, it's a good concept in, like, in that sense. Um, but given like, a, a comp like the comprehensive modern architecture around CDNs and stuff, I would consider different approaches in terms of how to ship the skeleton and how to hydrate it. Like, it's similar, like, I would actually like to see the big pipe support almost converted into an idea of, like, a cacheable skeleton in the CDN and, like, hydration support through, like, JS. Although that can be fraught for, like, spiders and stuff. Like, um, although even the regular big pipe approach can be challenging for things like spiders, like, depending on the capabilities. Although, like, Things like the Google bot basically run a full on headless browser at this point. Anything else? Cool. Thank you.